Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Creek Bible Church. I'm glad that you're here. Would you join me in standing as we sing together, Keep Walking with the Lord, if you're able. And we'll sing all three verses of this together this morning. That ought to keep us busy, hadn't it? Looking, watching, praying every day. Pray without ceasing. Keeping our eyes open, looking for what Jesus has for us to do. Let's bow together in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the beauty of the earth, for all that you've created. Thank you for your steadfast love for us, your faithfulness to us. You're always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You're listening for us, longing for us to walk with you. We've just sung about that, keep walking with the Lord. We pray that uh, that would be the desire of our heart, to walk with you, that we would do it in faithfulness back to you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your word that you've given to us to teach us, instruct us, to help us stand firm as we're together in your house this morning. We just pray that uh, you would continue to ground us, remind us of your word, help us to leave in confidence to stand strong for you. And just ask that all that we do and say here this morning might honor you, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, except for Dennis and Deb in their class and their verse. Very good. Mrs. Norton. on some young men to be bold and strong. Huh? <laughs> you did well on the verse. 
It'll be great to hear you next week say that. <laughs> How about our teens? And the adults. First Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 5.23 I ask you to remain standing and everyone else to join as we sing together that first verse of Keep Walking with the Lord as our classes are dismissed this morning. green okay all right we are all set does anybody need a worksheet from last week okay roger i got one back already from phyllis and i got a d plus on my paper I don't know if it's my spelling or my punctuation, but, uh, or both, yeah. So, I will work on that, Phyllis. Is there hope for somebody that's 68 years old? Okay, that's encouraging to hear. All right, we are going to be in 1 Thessalonians. We'll be starting out in chapter 5, and I'll get my papers around. When I saw that D plus on my English paper, I was used to that <laughs> ever since about second grade. All right, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 is where we're going to jump right in, but <clears throat> I've got a few questions, a little bit introductory. Um, let me see here. All right, on the, the handout sheet, I will get to in a minute. Thank you, Roger. On uh, the 1 Thessalonians... Was Paul happy or sad with the church at 1 Thessalonians? Do you think he was pretty happy with the way they were going, or was he really sad and depressed and kind of, uh, oh boy, that's a shipwreck there. What do you think? 
He was happy. Yep, I think he was too. And we see that in a few spots where he was uh, pretty happy with the first Thessalonians. And that church was very, very young, um, maybe six months old to a year old. Um, Thessalonica, the city, was that a seaport or was that an inland city metropolis? Seaport, that's correct. <clears throat> um, did Paul visit the Thessalonians and establish the church on his first or second missionary journey? Did I hear what? That's correct. Yep, his second time there, or his second uh, missionary. Did Paul write the letter from Athens or from Corinth? You got two choices. Take a guess. Athens? It's Corinth. Yep. Yes, he did take it from Corinth. And who brought him the information that he writes back to the Thessalonian church? Someone was with the Thessalonians. He got a report. Then he went back to Paul, and then Paul addressed what this person brought back to uh, Paul while he was in Corinth. Any guesses? Timothy. That's right. Yep. Um, was Paul in Thessalonica for about one year or approximately maybe one month? Pretty much one month. Because you see in Acts where it says that he preached on three Sabbaths in the synagogue, but that doesn't mean that he left right away. Most people think he stayed a little bit longer than that um, from some of his writings and some of the things that transpired for the Thessalonians to learn what they did. But it shows that he was in the synagogue for just three Sabbaths. So he was there a very short time. Did Paul leave Thessalonica on his own leisurely pace, or was he forced to leave quickly? Who said quickly? Okay, give me the background on that. It's in Acts, okay. Uh, who, who knows a little bit of background on that, how that happened? Pastor? Pastor? Yes, yep, they, they had to almost sneak him out. Um, I think it was Jason, they took and grilled him, and he was causing an uproar, and so he was forced to leave very quickly. He did not have that um, to leave at his own pace, um, but he did get quite a bit accomplished while he was there, and we'll just look at a uh, two things today that he had to go back and, and uh, resurface and retouch for the Thessalonians. Um, what was some of the problems or one problem that the Thessalonians had that Paul had to correct? And we see this in uh, the last part of chapter 4 and then what we're looking at today. What was some of the things, one of the things that he had to try and correct? They had thought they had missed the rapture. Correct. Yep. Then also, they were worried about the people that died in Christ before the rapture. And so, and we'll read chapter, the tail end of four again. So he had to deal with the last day events. Um, some thought they missed the rapture. Some thought that their relatives or their friends who had died were not going to make it to heaven or would miss the rapture. And that bothered them. And so that tells me one thing about the Thessalonica church was they were concerned about each other. They thought the person that had died before the rapture, oh, no, they're not going to make it to heaven. And they were concerned about that. That bothered them. So Paul had to go back and correct that and, and give them reassurance. 
And also they were confused about the rapture and the day of the Lord. Uh, and it's still an issue today on how things work out. Um, so the things that Paul had to deal with when he writes this in Thessalonica, there's a lot of great help here. But if we go back and look at Acts, I think Acts 1-7. I will read that. If I can find Acts, there it is. Actually, it starts in verse 6. And so when they had come together, the disciples, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times, epics, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So the Thessalonians, they weren't the first one to come up with, how is this timeline going to work? When are you, when's he going to do this? When's the rapture? The disciples were asking the very same thing. And in fact, it's almost word for word from Thessalonians 5. It is not for you to know the times and epics. So... You can't be real hard on them because the disciples wanted to know. And you and I, also, we wonder when we look at the world events, when is this going to happen? Did, where are we at in this timeline, in this picture? So that is um, a little introduction on what Paul was trying to um, get across to the Thessalonians. I'm glad he did because 2,000 years later, we need to know this also. We need to, we look at the world events and we got to go, boy, it's getting close. You know, we look at what's going on in Israel. We look at what's going on in the world and, and we should be very concerned. Um, now you can take out your worksheet that, uh, I made, and there's just three questions, and I'm just going to start with the first one, okay? And this is pretty simple. I'm going to point fingers so that I can get an answer, okay? It says, tell me one thing you know about the day of the Lord. Just one thing, okay? Well, let's start with Glenna. It's the future. It's the future, okay? Yep. Roger, one thing. The day of the Lord follows the tribulation, the seven years. Okay, yep. Um, and you know who put me up here? Brian Van Amen. So, Brian, tell me one thing you know about the day of the Lord. Okay, yep, that's correct. It's not the rapture. Yes. Yes, at the very end. Okay, I'm not going to get all that right. Esther Holmes, you don't get off the hook because you're in here too. So tell us one thing that you know about the day of the Lord. Yes. Yep. Do we see any writings in the Old Testament about the day of the Lord? There's a bunch of them. I think I saw as I was reading through, there's like 75 references in the Old Testament to the day of the Lord. Pastor. Yes. 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 Right. The one that's in capital letters. And I can I remember Pastor Branham Branham teaching like that that there was a lot of the day of the Lord's but then there's the one that we see here that is the big the big one. And absolutely I agree with you on that, Pastor. Um let me see. Ann, who does? Charlie. In the rapture. 
correct. Yep. Okay. And because you pointed, tell me one thing about the day of the Lord. What do you know? One thing. Okay. Yes. He's in control. Yes, Joy. It is. Yep. It is described great and terrible. Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. 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 Brian? The majority of it, as Pastor uh, said, there are small where he would speak to Israel, this is the day of the Lord. But this here, I think, is in capital letters. Um, so sometimes in the Old Testament, you, it could be referring to when they get annihilated in a, in a war. You know, this might be the day of the Lord. Yeah, could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's um, just, I'm going to read through uh, Ephesians, the Thessalonians 5, okay? Uh, so I will start reading right now. Now as to times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. And then while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us sleep as let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. All right. As I'm thinking about this, and I, uh, I wrote on the top of my notes, I wrote to myself, just be ready. Just be ready. We don't know everything. In fact, we really have limited, limited information, but the information says, just be ready, okay? And... And what I'm going to do is go back to 4.13 and read some of that and then get into 5. Now, in 4.13, we're talking about the rapture, okay? But he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. So once again, Timothy left Thessalonica, went to Paul and says, hey, we still have a problem here. They don't quite understand it. So Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to know as much as I know what God has revealed to me. And then once again, he says, about those who are asleep, those who have died in Christ, that you may not grieve. They were concerned about their fellow brethren that had died. Were they going to miss the rapture? Were they going to miss heaven? They were concerned about each other. They had a true love for each other. And then he, he starts to correct that. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Brethren, don't worry about those that have already died. They're secure in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain 
until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. So he's starting to set up the doctrine accurately. Don't worry. We're all going to make it, even whether we're dead or alive. And that it should be, as it was to the Thessalonians, it's great encouragement for me. Because in the last couple of years, I've had some death. My parents have left. My brothers left. I know that they fell asleep in Christ, and I'm going to see them again. I don't have to be like the Thessalonians and think, boy, my mom and dad missed the rapture. I'm not going to see them. So he's correcting that. And that was some of the Thessalonians thinking was that, the, and it was in air. Remember, Paul was only there maybe, it says three Sabbaths, so he was there a short while, but he tried to teach him on this complicated issue. And so he had to go back and help. Um, but once again, like I said, the Thessalonians were, they wanted to make sure they had this right. They wanted to know that they're going to see the, the loved ones. And let me jump down to verse 17. And then it says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That word is, is um, I don't think it's in the Greek where it says rapture. I think it's Latin. Yep. So we put that in there for, yeah, Arapaho. And we'll meet them in the clouds, in the air, and then we shall all be together. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And he also says that at the end of uh, 511. Encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing already. I, 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 I like this Thessalonican church. I just think, man. They, they had a right for only being two months old or six months old. So he has also cleared up the rapture, okay? So now he goes into the day of the Lord. And he says, now as to the times and the ep epic, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. He's kind of scolding them a little bit. They should have caught on when I was there and taught them, but they didn't. And so where he uses the word brethren, in this small epistle, I think he uses that word brethren, one, two, three, four, five, six, right around 10 different times. And it's an affectionate word. He calls them brethren. Um, let me see where I put up the word brethren. I, I kind of looked that up. I don't see it, but I do remember. Where this word brethren kind of represents is that they belong to something and from the original, from the origin. So they belong to the body of Christ. They're brethren in the body of Christ. You can go to, oh, give me like a VFW, okay? And you belong to the VFW. You are part of that. And where it originated, I'm not sure. But they can call each other brethren because they are with that organization of the VFW. So they can call them brethren. Well, that's, that applies right here too. We are brethren because we belong to the body of Christ. Um, I hear motorcycle gangs. Hey, how's my brother? My brother in the motorcycle club. Well, that's kind of what that word means, okay? But we take it as brethren being in the body of Christ. Yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as 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 you talk about that, Phyllis, I kind of take Thessalonians how he's tender with them and brethren, as with the Corinthians. Shall I praise you? I praise you not. He had a lot of trouble with the Corinthians 
And so he had to deal with them with probably some of his apostle authority. Here, like you said, he's gentle with them. He's got a, uh, he's got a good group of people. I hope that we model the Church of Thessalonica. Uh, they have a lot of things to be uh, proud of. Okay, any thoughts before I move on? Okay, so the, the Thessalonians, as, as they wanted to know, it looks like a lot of detail because what he says here, let me find, okay, it says, um, now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need. So times is like on a calendar. We've got one, two, three, four. That's a calendar. So he could say, I'm coming on June 2nd. And so we would look on our calendar and write that down. But he doesn't. And so the other word that he uses is epic. And epic refers to seasons. Um, maybe an event, okay? So um, a, a friend of mine, Bill Storm, he would say, oh, Lord, don't come during hunting season. Don't come, and that's what the word epic means, is don't come in this season. Now, me and Brian would say, Lord, don't come during golf season because we don't want to miss our golf. So he's captured both of them. He's saying, I'm not telling you if he's coming in the fall, if he's coming in the spring, if he's coming in the summer. Or he's not coming on June 5th. Be nice, that's my birthday. But he doesn't label the days like that. And he, and as he told the apostles the same thing in Acts. You don't need to know the times or the seasons. And that's kind of how he's af going after them. But he also says, you really, you should have known that. I shouldn't have had to write this back to you, but he did. Verse 2, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And I think one of my questions is, question two, why do you think Paul used the example of um, that he won't come like a thief in the night to compare to the day of the Lord? Why did he do that? What does a thief in the night have in common with the day of the Lord? Pardon? Comes quickly. Comes quickly. You, don't know when. you don't know when, exactly. Yep. Anything else? Better be alert. Yep. Yep. Joy. Yes. Yep. You're right. And Tyler. Me too. And I'm teaching. We don't come back. We we don't come back with him. This is after the rapture. He's there's he's right. So he's telling the. He's not. He's just telling us this is how it's going to happen because the Thessalonians think they're already in the middle of the day of the Lord. just so that they would understand. See, they think that right now, possibly, they're, with the persecution that they were receiving from the city of Thessalonica, there might be, there, I think they're already thinking, we're already in the day of the Lord. The Thessalonica church is thinking, boy, we're, we're in the day of the Lord. And he, Paul is trying to say, no, you're not. It hasn't started yet. And it will come like this. Even though you're right, the church won't be there. But he's trying to let the Thessalonians know how this is going to play out. Did I help you? Phyllis? Right. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, as we look at this, there's is a is a tough issue. Schofield, you know all who else Schofield and Mr. Ironside, they do not agree. And these are two scholars. They don't agree when it starts. Phyllis holds to what I think is that the day of the Lord is like a thousand seven years, approximately. You got the thousand year millennium. but it's still the day of the Lord. Are you holding that the day of the Lord is just the seven-year tribulation? Right. Okay, so you look at the day of the Lord as a seven-year period? Okay, so you don't put the thousand. See, I hold it that the day of the Lord is a thousand seven years. Yep. Because during the millennium, I see your hand. During the millennium, God rules with a rod of iron. So when there's sin, man is not getting away with it. His judgment is going to come right now during that millennium period. So... The millennial period doesn't, to me, always look like it's full of blessings because God is going to rule that nation, the whole thousand years. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, and like I said, that is an issue that the great scholars argue about. Schofield and Ironside could not, one of them held to just the thousand years, and the other one held to that the day of the Lord starts with the rapture. So that's uh, an issue that you're going to have to decide for yourself to a certain degree. Pastor Holmes? Yes. Yes, yep, right, yep, I, I agree. And like I said, the Thessalonians thought they were already uh, experiencing some of the day of the Lord, and Paul trying to say, no, it hasn't started yet. So, yes. 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 At the end of the millennium, that uh, the the nations gather together again, and then Christ come back because during the millennium He rules with a rod of iron. But you still have sin in that thousand years, and you see what it does at the end of the thousand years that Christ comes back. 
we're going to have to skip pretty quick and leave that debate for another day. Um, but I do have uh, one more uh, pastor. Yep. does yep right yep yeah yes yep okay so back to my original question um he, he's he's teaching the Thessalonians and he says for yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come and like I said, they think maybe they're already in it and that it's already started and possibly they also thought they missed the rapture. But he says when it starts, it's going to come like a thief in the night. And then as we looked at a thief in the night, we looked at it, it comes uninspectedly because he says, I'm not going to tell you that it happens on June 5th. I'm not going to tell you that it happens during hunting season, but it's going to come like a thief in the night it's going to come quick me and my wife know what happens with a thief in the night before we moved where we lived on Pfeiffer Road we were broken into five or six times and they cleaned house I would get my insurance check and I would replace everything they stole six months later they'd come back and steal it again in fact they tried breaking in the house when Chris was home she opened up the curtain on the slider door and there he stood trying to pry the door open now he came as a thief in the night I love my wife and if I knew he was coming I would have stayed home that night and been there or if I'd have known what other night he was coming I would have been there so that thief in the night we don't know when the day of the Lord is going to start and he's letting the Thessalonians know. Well, you're not going to know when it starts. Just like you don't know when the rapture is. Um, so he, as in, in verse 5, the very first word, he says now. Okay? And he uses that a lot here. He also uses it in 1 Corinthians. He's addressing the issue. Timothy came back, said, hey, the Thessalonians don't really understand this. They, they think that they some of them missed the rapture. And the, so he starts to, to address that, and he says, now. So he's, he's going to answer what Timothy brought back from Thessalonica. Okay, let's go on down to verse 3. And it says, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay, I'm going to try and explain this a little bit. Um, the rapture has happened, okay? And we're at the, I believe we're at the very first part of the seven years of the tribulation. So the church is gone, and the media is saying everything's okay. Because the world's going to be in disarray when the rapture happens. Do you, when you're flying an airplane, do you let people know that after the rapture happens, uh, this plane's going down? That's a reality. That's a reality. Okay. Um, just like I'm, uh, I'm racing Tyler's '69 Dart, and I got my Camaro, and we're going down the road, and we've taken up both lanes, and the rapture happens. So here's two cars coming at you. It sounds funny, but it's a reality. Because when that rapture happens, there's going to be a lot of things that they're not going to be able to explain. There's going to be just, there's not going to be any preaching. This church will be empty. Um, 
it's just going to be chaos. And so whether it be the day after the rapture or in the very beginning of the tribulation, they're going to be saying, the media, Zuckerberg, he's going to be saying, oh, we're glad those people are gone. We don't know where they went, but they're gone and we're glad. So don't worry. Peace and safety. We're going to be okay. Everything's going to be just fine. And then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. The church is gone. This destruction that we see coming is, it's, and they're going to try and say, don't worry about it. Everything's okay. Uh, it's not going to be okay. God's uh, judgment is going to start at that period. And destruction will come upon them. And then let's go to verse 4. I got way behind. Verse 4 says, brethren, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So what he's telling them is, believers, you have stepped out of darkness. And you have stepped out of darkness into the light so that the day of the Lord will not overtake you. You will be raptured. You know that the day of the Lord is coming. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to know the exact day that the day of the Lord period is going to start. That day will have no effect on you because you're going to be gone from chapter 4. So don't feel like that you are going to be in this. So he says, brethren, you are not in darkness. You have stepped into the light. You are saved. You don't have to worry about this. You don't have to worry that the day should overtake you like a thief. You're not there. You are gone. You are gone with the rapture. And so he, at this point, has made a transition, and he's telling the Christians how they should live, okay? He says, for you are the sons of light and the sons of day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. You have missed the day of the Lord because you have stepped into the light. You have crossed over the line. You are a Christian. You're not going to be here. Now, the people that are the sons of the night and sons of the dark, they're still going to be there. They're, they're the ones that are going to feel the wrath of God in that. And then verse 5, it says, For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. We are not going to be in the day of the Lord as this is talking about here. But why should we be alert and sober? We know that day is coming. What, why does he say that? Prepared. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we know this day of the Lord is coming. We should be telling people. We know it's coming. He's told us right here how it's coming. We need to be sober and alert. And we need to be able to tell people, hey, the day of the Lord is coming. The rapture is coming. You better get saved. Uh, here's, here's how uh, God has written about it coming in other portions in Revelation throughout the Old Testament. Here's what the day of the Lord looks like. You need to get saved. So he says, let us sleep. Then let us not sleep as others. Who do you think in verse 6 is he talking about? He says, so then let us not sleep as others. Who are the others? You think unbelievers? I don't think so. I think he's talking about some people in the church who are not alert and are not sober. I think he's addressing Christians in the church and says, don't let us be like the others. There was a man at Milo Bible Church. He was pretty regular, but uh, about halfway through the service, he was asleep. 
Um, I, I had a problem with that, but, you know, some people may have sleep apnea or whatever. But I, and in verse 6, I think he is talking about, so then let us not sleep as others, that some people in the church are not paying attention to what's going on in our world right now. Uh, we see a lot of things that are going on. We should almost be, man, that rapture could happen at any time. This, the way this world is in a mess. So he's, he's giving us a little chastisement too. So then let us not sleep as others do. And I, I think he's, and Pastor Norton has probably seen when he's up here looking this way and then the guy, don't let us be like that. It's a spiritual sleep more than it is a physical sleep. But don't let us be spiritually asleep. Paul gives us a warning there. But let us be alert and sober. Okay, um, I think I have a question. Verse 3, or chat, uh, question 3, says, be alert. The people in Florida were to be alert. They were notified, and they were told all this was coming. How does that transfer to us as Christians? Because Paul says we need to be alert and sober. Some were, absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. He should almost be just like the weatherman in Florida. Here's what's coming. There's a hurricane coming. You need to get ready. You need to be alert. You don't, uh, you know, I, I wonder, the, the storm hit at 8 o'clock or so. I wonder how many people were in bed going, ah, that's going to blow right over us. And they're asleep. That transfers to the Christian life. You and I should be telling people, be sober, be alert. The day of the Lord, the rapture is coming. We're not very far away. So we need to be sober and to be alert. Uh, I'll be alert when you have the opportunity to tell somebody about what the future events are coming. Because we're getting close, I believe. The Thessalonians thought they'd already missed it. Or that they were in the middle of it. Here we are 2,000 years later and it really hasn't happened yet. But to me, it's intimate. Gerald? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and, and in our Christian life, we can warn people, but once the day of the Lord starts there may not be much chance for rescue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, verse 7. For those, now once again, he's talking to the Thessalonians, and he is saying, don't worry about the day of the Lord. You've been saved. You're going to be gone when the rapture happens. But here's how you should be living. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since you are of the day, since you've been saved, you need to be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he says, here's how you live. Here's how you live and warn people. We are to be sober. We are to have the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation that we can tell people what's coming. Here's what's coming. And then he goes on in verse 9, and he says, for God has not destined, and once again, remember the Thessalonians don't exactly have this whole thing figured out. Obviously, we don't either. There's some disagreement. How long is the tribulation? How long is the millennium? And how long is the day of the Lord? But the one thing that he does reassure the Thessalonians, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
And he tells us that also in Thessalonians 1, 10. He says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thessalonians, you get saved, you don't have to worry about this. But you don't have to worry about the wrath to come. Um, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we are awake or asleep. Once again, the Thessalonians thought that the, the people who died early before the rapture weren't going to make it. But he says here, that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live with Christ. So he's helping the Thessalonians get through that. Roger, did I see your hand? Well, I was going to say, what a scripture to think of. Uh, the day of the Lord will come and bring judgment. Punishment on those who are left. That's a good argument. I had some water here, but I don't know where I put it. Oh, here. I've already drank out of it, but. <laughs> no, but that's, that's a good argument. Yes. We're covering the church. We know we're going to be in the great tribulation. Yeah, we're not. We're, we're, we're not going to be here for that wrath. Okay, so it says that who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another. We need to encourage one another as the Thessalonican church did, and we need to build up one another, just as the Thessalonicans have been doing. So we can take these words and be encouraged from them. And, and as Paul tries to correct the Thessalonicans on that. Um, I, let me finish up one thing. Um, you would think that Paul has this nailed right down, but turn over to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Remember what Paul's dealing with. He's trying to correct the teaching on the rapture and the day of the Lord. Thessalonians 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter. They forged a letter, I think, and said it from Paul. And it says, and it is in effect about the day of the Lord has come. So he has to write a follow-up letter because the first letter didn't get everything nailed down. And that we see that they got a evil spirit or they got a message that was not accurate. They even had a fake letter saying that the day of the Lord had already come. And so in verse 3, he says, let no one deceive you, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first. So he didn't get it completely nailed down. They still had trouble with it. We see Months later, I think I read that 2 Thessalonians followed 1 Thessalonians within a month. Um, but hopefully we don't have to worry about missing the rapture. That We are more informed than the Thessalonians. After teaching this Sunday school, I'm not sure how we're doing. Uh, Bill? Bill? Yes. Yeah. To help with that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. 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 And they were all new Christians. The church wasn't, uh, Thessalonica Church was only three or four months old. And then they had to deal with the topic. Here, here we are 2,000 years later, and we still have a little bit of a different view on how all these events lay out. But what Paul was trying to warn them or encourage them, don't worry. Once you step into the light, 
you're going to miss that. You are on the sons of light and sons of day. We are not sons of nightness, darkness. We don't practice that. And he encourages the Thessalonians, don't practice that lifestyle. Don't be drunk. Be sober. Okay, now that I've got everybody confused, you can go home and figure it out. Um, <laughs> so we will uh, pray. Who's, who's teaching next week? Roger? And you got your notes handed out? Okay, so let's pray and close up. And uh, we'll pray for the morning service to come. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the words that you give us in Thessalonians that we need to read and study and try and understand them the best we can and that we would live as the Thessalonians do, that they cared about one another, they were worried about one another, uh, that they had missed the rapture and that they were in the day of the Lord. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for this writing. And once again, we also pray for the morning service to come and that the word coming will change our lives and we will know for sure that we are in Christ. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. You are dismissed.